My name is Paul Spenden. I'm professor of law at Liberty University School of Law. We're going to talk about the Hyatt Regency collapse in Kansas City in July of 1981. When the uh, collapse occurred, I was assistant attorney general assigned uh, the duty of providing legal advice to the Missouri Board of uh, Architects, Professional Engineers, and Land Surveyors. The, the board looked to me with, uh, for guidance as to how the uh, investigation should occur. We were basically uh, looking to see uh, how to gather evidence and to present it in anticipation of litigation. And so it fell my role to take the lead as to uh, how that investigation should come about. On July 17, 1981, uh, uh, the Hyatt Regency Hotel uh, was staging a tea dance, as was its custom through the summer. Every Friday evening, I believe it was every Friday evening, would hold a, a special dance in its atrium. It was, a, it was the new hotel in town. It was where people liked to gather. And so thousands gathered on July 17th uh, to, to celebrate the, the new building, the new environment, and to, uh, and to dance. And at about 7 o'clock, uh, finally, the fourth, one of the four floor bridges failed, slipped off of its, uh, of its connection, and, and the bridges collapsed. And 114 people who were dancing underneath it uh, were were killed and hundreds of others were were injured. The the cause of the uh, of the collapse occurred as a result of the failure of the uh, of any engineer uh, to do uh, engineering uh, uh, calculations on the steel to steel connections on the on the bridges that spanned the the atrium in the Kansas City uh, Hotel. It was, it was basically a lack of communication. It was the, it was the expectation of the professional engineer uh, that uh, all he had to do was come up with a basic design concept, as, or at least that's the way I understood his, his position. And that once he was done with that, uh, with that basic design and released his drawings to the fabricator and the erector and the other engineers that might be uh, involved in the project, his job was, was done. It was over. He didn't need to take any further responsibility. So he kind of had a team concept uh, about the, his approach to, uh, to the work on the Hyatt Regency. Um, I have one aspect of the, the, of the design work. My job is done. I don't need to worry about communicating with any of the other uh, engineers or taking any responsibility for seeing that others are doing their job. The, the board had an entirely different uh, uh, understanding of his responsibilities in light of Missouri law. Missouri law, we thought, was very clear uh, that when an engineer takes upon an, uh, an engineering project and places his seal upon uh, that, that project, he is taking full responsibility for all engineering aspects of that job unless he is very clear to communicate to others that, that he's not doing that. And in this case, there was no such uh, qualifications. There was no reservation by the engineer. Uh, the structural engineers, uh, Jack D. Gillum and, and associates, Jack Gillum and uh, Dan Duncan, uh, assumed responsibility for their contract said all engineering uh, on the Hyatt project uh, and uh, prepared as part of the design team the basic structural drawings including the steel to steel connections that that uh, made up the, uh, the uh, walkways that spanned the, uh, the atrium. But when they were finished with those, with those drawings and placed their seal upon them, there were no qualifications, no restrictions as to what their assumption of responsibility, uh, responsibilities were. And they passed them off to the uh, fabricator. When Haven Steel, the fabricator on the, on the project, uh, began to, uh, t took the, uh, the concept drawings uh, that he received from the structural engineer, uh, Jack Gillum and, and Dan Duncan, and, and began to prepare shop drawings for the purpose of erection and preparation of the steel and erection of the, of the steel, he noticed that there was a, a real problem with the concept of the bridges. Uh, the bridges were intended uh, for 
the second floor bridge to be immediately under the fourth floor bridge and that they were to be connected with a single continuous rod. Uh, the, uh, the fabricator developed an, uh, a, a concern that that may not be possible to erect in the field. Uh, and it may not even be possible to find a rod of that length. And so with those two uh, problems in mind, he, uh, the evidence that we presented to uh, the uh, administrative law judge that uh, heard the case uh, was that uh, uh, the fabricator, William Ritchie, uh, called Dan Duncan, the lead structural engineer, and said, we've got a problem. We need to look at this. We think that there may be a solution. Let's split the rod uh, at the fourth floor, terminate the rod from the ceiling at the fourth floor bridge, and begin a new rod from the fourth floor bridge down to the second floor bridge. And uh, uh, the evidence that we presented was that Dan Duncan responded, that's a, that's a good solution. Draw it up on the shop drawings, and I will take a look at it when those shop drawings come back in um, uh, to the office. Um, we presented evidence that indeed the technician going over the shop drawings when they ba arrived back at Jack Gillum uh, and, and Associates found the difference, noticed it instantly, and went in to Dan Duncan uh, and, uh, and said, there's been a change. And uh, Mr. Duncan's response was, I'm aware of the change. I've talked to the fabricator. It's okay. And so no calculations. No calculations have been done by the fabricator uh, of the change because he had been uh, told that it would be checked and, and calculated back at uh, the structural engineer's office. Uh, uh, Dan, for whatever reason, Dan Duncan decided that the calculations had already been done and did not calculate the, uh, the connection. There was a, uh, another uh, telephone call to Dan Duncan from the architect on the project, Herb Duncan, asking about the, the change, the, the split in the rods. He was certainly concerned about the aesthetic uh, impact on the project, uh, but he also was very uh, uh, circumspect to ask about the safety. Is this going to impact safety in any way? And the response that he got from Dan Duncan, the evidence that we presented at the, at the proceedings was that uh, Mr. Duncan's response is, no problem with safety, it's okay. And so uh, with no calculations being done on that steel-to-steel uh, -steel connection with a split rod configuration, uh, the, the bridges were erected uh, and were, was doomed for failure. The, the hotel, uh, after erection, was open for about a year before the failure occurred in July of 1981. In the middle of construction, I believe it was October of 1979, uh, early one Sunday morning, with the onset of cold weather, uh, the connections failed in the atrium. The building was, was not complete, wasn't nearly complete. It was still rough in, in rough stages. Uh, uh, but the connections failed and all of the atrium steel, steel fell to the, to the floor. If the hotel had been open and that had occurred, there would have been many more than 114 people died that day. The owner of the of the hotel, uh, Hallmark became very concerned that it had an unsafe building. So it convened all of the professionals, the architects, the professional engineers, everyone, and hired in a very special ins uh, inspector, Seiden and Page, to look into the situation. There was, a, uh, there was instruction given, as I understand it, uh, to uh, Jack Gillum and, uh, and Associates to recheck all of the steel-to-steel -steel connections in the building. Later, uh, at a later meeting, uh, there was reassurance given to the architect and to the owner that indeed that had occurred, uh, that Greg Luth at Jack Gillum and Associates had gone over the entire building and had looked at the steel-to-steel -steel connections, including the bridges, specifically said including the bridges, the walkways that spanned the atrium, uh, and we have checked now, those connections uh, for compliance. Uh, and in fact, that was not done. It was, it was an, an untruth, and it was a missed opportunity to realize no calculation had been done uh, on the bridge connections. As I recall the testimony at the, at the proceedings and asked to explain why that was the case, 
why would the uh, Greg Luth not do what he had indicated, check all of the steel-to-steel -steel connections? The answer was, well, we spot-checked and we just didn't hit the bridges. We would have done more, but we weren't being paid. Ignorance of the law was, was astounding. The experts that were presented by uh, Mr. Duncan and, and Mr. Gillum at the proceedings uh, parroted the positions that they had taken that, well, no. Uh, in fact, uh, there, were, there were times in the proceedings where uh, the experts for the other side would be shown the law and say, are you aware of those kinds of expectations? And, and they would express surprise that, uh, that uh, the law would impose those obligations upon them. Well, I was astounded uh, as a member of the public uh, looking to professional engineers to protect me uh, from uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the traps of a, uh, of a dangerous building, uh, that there would be professional engineers who were unaware of what the, law, uh, what the law's obligations were and what, what uh, responsibilities it imposed upon them. And I can only think that there must be some failure in engineering schools to communicate to, uh, to uh, young engineers or young would-be engineers uh, what the what you do and the entire engineering project, if you're going to be the structural engineer on a building project. But if you're not, let somebody know. The expectation is that you will communicate with all of the professionals uh, that are involved, the, the architect, uh, with the, the, the fabricator and his engineers, uh, and, and, and you're not merely an insular, isolated team player, but you are you are the leader uh, of structural engineer unless you make it clear that that's not your role. And, and then if we're aware of what your, what your role is, then the architect and the owner on a project can, can take appropriate steps. The law in, in Missouri is very clear uh, that uh, if an engineer takes that position that he must be very careful that he communicates that expectation to all the parties involved. If he doesn't communicate, if he says nothing as happened in this situation, then who else are we going to, uh, to look to for responsibility but, to, uh, but uh, to, to him? So Dan Duncan, by virtue of not knowing the law, not following that practice, uh, set in place a, a collapse that was needless, had no reason to occur. After 27 days of, of uh, trial-like proceedings in front of an administrative law judge who, who rendered more than 400 pages of findings of fact and conclusions of law uh, in, in this case, uh, declaring that uh, Jack Gillum and Dan Duncan had violated the Practice Act of Missouri for professional engineers, uh, the board uh, decided that it would revoke the licenses uh, of uh, th those two gentlemen and the firm for which uh, uh, they were GEC, uh, uh, GCE consultants. Uh, two courts, the uh, Circuit Courts of Missouri and the Missouri Court of Appeals reviewed that decision quite extensively and, and affirmed the decision. Being leery of depending upon structural engineers to be able to suspend bridges by, by quarter and inch rods, uh, the owner decided that uh, to re regain any kind of confidence uh, in, in the public for his, uh, for his hotel, uh, that he would have to, uh, to replace those bridges, so suspended bridges, uh, with bridges that rested upon columns that not only uh, that were big round columns that went to the floor, but that went through the floor and went all the way down to a bedrock. I'm not even certain an earthquake would take out the bridges today.